Our country is not on the verge of trouble, or is already right next to it. Our country is already in trouble. Drones fly throughout the central part of Russia, up to Moscow and St. Petersburg. They even attacked the Kremlin. Our Black Sea fleet is knocked out, as if we are not a great power with a great fleet, but some third-rate country, ships that can knock out as they want. Our aviation practically does not work, because it is also shot down. We are in the same positions we took over two years ago, and partly in the same positions from which we retreated over two years ago. People, the population is dying out, impoverished, drinking, no one cares, they only have time to bring in migrants. I think that we will put an end to this. The editor of The Insider, Timur Olevsky, is in touch with us today. Greetings. Hello, Katerina. I am very glad to see you. Likewise. Georgi Zakrevsky, the founder of the Russian PMC Paladin, openly calls for the overthrow of the government and claims that the blame for the failures at the front and Russia's internal problems lies with Putin. And, in fact, he said that after the coup d'etat, he would repeal all the laws adopted in Russia in recent years, expel all migrants, annul their Russian passports and, of course, return Ukraine. I don't know what he means, but nevertheless. The point of no return has been passed, that's the name of his video. To what extent do you assess whether this point of no return was there and when was it passed? The point of no return was passed when the war began, and, unfortunately, people like Zakrevsky deceive their public, thinking that if the government is overthrown and Putin is gone, then the war will stop. Because it is quite obvious that when this happens, Russia will finally begin to deal with its problems that have accumulated during the war. Russia has squandered all the accumulated resources that it had as a great country in this war and has become, as he rightly says, a third-rate country. It has just turned before our eyes. Of course, it did not turn in the last two years, it was just a formalization of the transformation, it all began with the Crimea. And more broadly, it all began from the moment the Kremlin brought Putin back in 2012, from the point of maximum development of civil society, social freedoms, creative initiative and the vector aimed at the future. Russia has turned down and is rolling there at different speeds, quickly after Crimea, and rapidly after the start of the war. As a result, in fact, I rolled to what I rolled to. And the most surprising thing is that people like Zakrevsky do not understand that the greatness of a country is not determined by the presence of a fleet, but is ensured by the happiness of people living on its territory. And to ensure the safety and happiness of the people living in your country, you need a great navy and a lot of weapons if that country is surrounded by enemies, like Israel, or in other similar situations. The army, militaristic aspirations, and foreign policy all serve to protect and ensure the safety of your happy citizens. If people are happy, and the country is great, then you gain the strength to protect this great happiness. But if the country is unhappy, people live in poverty and squalor, and chaos reigns in their minds, then there is no strength for protection and nothing to rely on. And it is not clear what it is needed for. In fact, Putin initially doomed people to misery, replacing their personal happiness of development and living a meaningful life with an existence for which their children are not ashamed. Putin broke their lives and replaced them with a mythical sense of happiness from living under the Tsar. And then he is surprised that his strength, his shoulder of power rests on dust. And it is surprising that all this fleet, army, planes, tanks and shells, leaning on dust, break down and cannot use their strength, faced with the rebuff of people who lived in a happy country, where the army was an extension of the power of happy people who defend their happiness from those who want to take it away.
Imagine a branch of a tree with a dense and hard trunk, along which the sap of life oozes, and the branch of a rotten tree, which looks the same, but there is emptiness inside. What do you think, if you hit one branch or you hit another branch, what will be the result? And if these trees are swayed against each other by the wind, one tree will stand with its branch, and the other will break and the branch will fall, like the Black Sea Fleet falls into the Bay of Sevastopol. This, in fact, is what is happening and what is the danger of what Zakrevsky says from everything I have heard. Well, that's my thought about his words. What is the danger? The danger is that these people really want a legal revolution, a coup in which they must win the forces that will simultaneously fight even more, driving all the people to war with Ukraine in order to prove something to themselves, as the Bolsheviks did at the beginning of the 20th century. And on the other hand, he wants to expel all migrants at the same time. This, of course, is a funny story, because I still cannot understand the logic of people who are now fighting migrants in Russia. I just can't understand the logic of people who simultaneously send men who are able to work to their deaths, and on the other hand, send men who are able to work home. It seems to me that they live in some mythical idea of how the economy exists, and they will be surprised when it collapses. It seems to me that they will not understand the moment when. You know, we have been talking here for many years, after the start of the war, Katya, two years already, yes, and you asked me more than once at the beginning of 2022, at the beginning of the war, whether I believed that Russia could fall apart. Because failures in the war can lead Russians to the idea that it is not clear why they are together in the same country. I told you then that no, Russia could not fall apart, because it is a very large country with enormous physical energy. Such masses do not fall apart, they can mic, but they will still come together in the end. But from what these people are doing, it begins to seem that yes, they can, because even now it seems that in the absence of a central government in Russia, which people like Zakrevsky want to introduce, and God grant that they do this, there is no question. More successful republics that can live independently will not simply begin to live independently, they will need to feed their people. And it is quite possible that Tatarstan will suddenly be able to provide happiness to people living on its territory, more than on the territory of Russia. And suddenly imagine that Tatarstan will become a place for the emigration of people from Moscow. Because people live happier there. Why not? Now it seems that how can this be imagined? It is easy to imagine such a thing when the lights go out in Moscow. And the lights in Moscow may be turned off not because the Ukrainian army will occupy the territory of the Kursk nuclear power plant, but because, I don't know, but because the Ukrainian army will turn off the transformer that feeds the distribution network that controls the distribution network, as Russia has done in Ukraine for several years in a row. For example, or the Ukrainian army may not do this. That's not the question. The problem is that in Russia, there is now such a phenomenon as in China last year, a wild overheating of the housing market. That is, so that you understand, developers who have been building a housing pyramid in Russia for many years now have debts of 10% of unsold new apartments. Because people have no money, because inflation has been accelerated. It would seem that they are now being paid a lot of money for signing a contract with the Ministry of Defense and the money should have been but there is no money. Look, Russia receives money for the production of weapons that are spent on war. These weapons do not bring any added value to the country's economy. Inflation is accelerated by the fact that you make more weapons. But these weapons cannot be used on a tank, you cannot cook potatoes at home. And at some point, this thing will just collapse. How, by the way, the economy collapsed in Bolshevik Russia after the revolution. They began to sell gold and valuables looted from people who had something before the revolution. In fact, it is clear that it is pointless to compare such things, because there is nothing in common between that situation and what can happen in Russia now. But the economy will not withstand and will burst. And those people who say that the Russian economy is stronger than ever are lying. And even those people who say that sanctions do not work are a little disingenuous and deceitful. 
because many people have learned to circumvent sanctions. And many people were able to make money on these sanctions. For example, we are preparing an investigation about people who have learned to sell oil through the countries of the Middle East for a lot of money, exceeding the established limit of $60 per barrel. Well, there is a certain pillow on top. This pillow is being robbed. It is simply stolen. Someone earned a billion there. But all this does not get into the Russian economy. And as soon as the coup happens, this billion will not return to Russia in any way. He will leave immediately. And there, somewhere in these lower eastern countries, houses, apartments, cars and new businesses in Europe will take shape. And this thing will just collapse. Therefore, the proposal to carry out a coup looks like a proposal to turn Russia into a real federal state, where each of the federal republics will become an independent state, or, at least, some of them can become more successful, since people on the territory of these republics will live better, and the central part of Russia, after thinking, will go to work there. Therefore, when Mr. Zakrevsky proposes to simultaneously fight with Ukraine and expel migrants, I want to say good luck to him. Mr. Zakrevsky, I am a Muscovite, I love the city, I feel sorry for it very much, I feel it, but I think that my city is waiting for a period of decline. In this case, a long decline, such as, for example, the city of Rome experienced after the fall of the Roman Empire. Well, then it was hundreds of years, now it is less, it has accelerated. After it has gone from being the capital of a world empire to a strange backwater. And the city of Rome was a strange backwater for about 500 years. And this is roughly what Mr. Zakrevsky promises to the city in which I was born, the city of Moscow. There are also conspiracy theories that, at least in the military correspondent parties, they are now discussing that Putin's inner circle is begging him to resign and transfer power to Belousov or Mishustin. Bizarre, they say, while he is thinking, he is allegedly promised safety, security for his family, and even to keep everything he has looted over the years, because we know that Russia's budget is equal to Putin's, that is, it is kind of the same thing. Still, do you believe in such conspiracy theories? I have not heard of such conversations, I do not believe that they are possible, but imagine if anything, it would happen. Let's fantasize that all this is true, you and I don't know, so everything is possible. It's like saying about Schrodinger. As long as we are not mistaken, Putin is both the president and the person who asks to resign, then these are probably people who want to end the war. Because what is the point of Putin resigning, if not to stop the war and save what is left? But here a question arises. The situation has gone so far that people like Mishustin and Belousov will have to solve two problems at the same time. First, to find loyal security officials who will be able to quickly and effectively destroy people like Mr. Zakrevsky with stupid ideas about building a fascist state like the 20th century. And on the other hand, to somehow return the workforce to Russia. That is, they will need to simultaneously solve the problem with migrants and the problem with their. If they can do it and feel the strength to do it, then, of course, it is very great. But it seems to me that those people who are now at war with people like Mr. Zakrevsky, at the time of the transfer of power, will have their own ideas about how it should be. And I fully imagine that the war between the forces of law and order of the provisional government and fascists like Zakrevsky on the streets of Moscow seems quite real. You said that you could not go to Russia. Can I draw attention to one thing, Katya, since we are discussing all sorts of military correspondents and bloggers like Zakrevsky, in the Russian consciousness, in the consciousness of these people, military correspondents who cover the war, there has been a fundamental breakdown and a fundamental change. At the beginning of the war, they very carefully avoided naming the directions of military operations in their reports, which would indicate the direction to Russia. That is, look, when they fought around Donetsk, they called it the Slavic direction. 
When there was the Kharkov operation, it was called the Kharkov direction. Even when they retreated, they still called it the Kharkiv direction. But now some of them suddenly begin to call it the Belgorod direction. They shouted strictly in various telegram channels. Their colleagues said, what are the Belgorod direction? We are not fighting in the direction of Russia. We are fighting towards Kyiv. We have the Kharkiv direction, and there is no Belgorod direction. And now they, without hesitation, call what is happening in the Kursk region the Kursk direction of hostilities. This consciousness has changed. In this logic, they should call it all the Sumi direction, but they do not do so, because even they, professional liars and propagandists, understand that the reality is such that it is no longer possible to call it the Sumi direction. The tongue does not turn, the direction is Kursk. This is a very important change. This is a very important change in the psychology of attitude to the war that took place among them. And I just followed this carefully. Language never lies. Slavkov, when you read it, and here, in fact, is one of his last texts. Surprisingly, I don't think there's any way we can catch the enemy. We launched the armed forces of Ukraine into our Kursk region through the border, which was supposed to be a continuous line of defense. Now we have mobile defense. We, like a goalkeeper in table hockey for children, move to the right and left in the hope that the enemy will bump into us, and he bypasses and appears in our rear on the flanks. He entered, received reinforcements from the Ukrainian Sumi region, and then launches his tentacles into the body of the Kursk region. We catch them. And, in fact, he gives an analogy with Debaltsev, with the 14th year and so on. But, nevertheless, well, as if Sladkov, the military correspondent, Respondent is talking about something that Putin does not talk about. Probably, censorship or fear of Ramzan Kadyrov do not allow him to say that we cannot catch the enemy because he missed us. Somehow amazingly, somehow he passed us by. We were waiting for him, but he still does not come out to us and does not come out to us. Well, yes, I don't even know what to say here. Is that why we moved deep into the territory of Russia in order to wait for him there? Even deeper. Listen, you understand what a story it is. I don't know what will happen in the Kursk region in Ukraine, because I'm afraid to guess. And the only thing I know for sure is that I don't see the desire of the locals comparable to the desire of the people of Ukraine to defend their land, because it seems to me that they do not perceive what is happening as something that they can influence. This is the first thing. And secondly, I see how various madmen, like Margarita Simonian, in the Russian telegram call for the bombing of everything that is there. Well, 150 people will die, this is our land, and we can do whatever we want on our land. Or, for example, I heard some proposals, let's take a tactical one. Sorry, I'm looking out the window, because I'm thinking. You know, I look, there are still thoughts on the ceiling. Or there, for example, people who say, let's use tactical nuclear weapons, the West will not tell us anything on our territory. This is a fantastic story that people living in the Kursk region hear. And what do they hear in these words? They hear something like this, that the price of your... Because Russia is the successor country of the Soviet Empire, which has a tradition of disposing of the fate of peoples, hundreds of thousands and millions of people, whom it can exterminate, send to Siberia, exile to the Kazakh steppe, or do it more simply. For Russia, 150,000 people are just a resource. This is a rare, direct interpretation of the proverb or saying, the forest is cut down, the chips fly. And people understand that they are splinters for Russia. And, in principle, if the Kremlin decides that political expediency requires bombing everything and using tactical nuclear weapons, then they will do it. It is clear that no one will have a question about how the residents of Kursk are doing. The inhabitants of Kursk live in order to be bombed at the right moment, because their life in itself, be that as it may, is worth nothing. It is only worth something abstract in the form of the greatness of the motherland or an area of square kilometers. This knowledge, as if, first of all, it is broadcast by people close to the authorities directly allowed. 
They are not even ashamed of it. Secondly, this knowledge, I think, does not motivate people who live in the cursed region, and does not give them hope that someone will come and that they need to immediately start defending their land. Because the way this power treats these people is so horrible that no other power, whatever it is, even from Mars, can be worse. This, by the way, is also a rather scary thing that Russians are now learning about their country and, it seems to me, are trying it on for the first time. The only thing that is not clear to me is why they wanted such a terrible life for the citizens of a neighboring country who lived in a completely different way. This is completely impossible to understand, so it does not surprise me, but rather saddens and upsets me when I see things like a video of a woman from Kursk watching TV, where they apparently talk about how Russia is about to capture Kyiv, and then hears outside the window the explosions of Ukrainian missiles, which are shot down or not shot down by Russian air defenses. That is, there is a war going on outside her window, and there is a victory on TV, and she does not correlate these two events in any way. And this inability to gather reality and fiction into one logical chain is just some kind of incredible tragedy of the Russian people. An incredible tragedy that he now faced personally. And as for all sorts of, do you understand what a thing? These people are calling for a holy war against the adversary of the Ukrainian. But the enemy, the Ukrainian, even for the residents, it is clear that no one likes the war, and, probably, many civilians died, simply because civilians died during the hostilities, this is the problem. But if we talk about power and the way of managing territories, then Ukraine is not trying to manage and administer this territory. Many times the Ukrainian military told me that there is no task of occupation, so there is no task of building state institutions. Imagine that the residents of the Kursk region are left to themselves for the first time. I remember the moment when the inhabitants of all Russia were more or less left to themselves. It was 2011, the end of the Medvedev era, when the country was more loyal and therefore did not interfere in what was happening inside the country. It's just that many things were left to chance. The country blossomed, and people in Siberia said, Lord, what happiness. We do what we want, we get rich from the fact that we do work, and no one touches us. Unfortunately, this never lasts long. Maybe it's a pity for the residents of the Kursk region to leave them alone, just left to themselves, so that they can rest in peace and start living like human beings, if we are serious. By the way, about how the residents of the Kursk region feel now, Ukrainian journalists went there for the first time and, in fact, took several shots of how the Russian authorities evacuated the population from the border areas in the Kursk region. Spoiler, as usual, in no way, well, and the people themselves. And how can they evacuate him? Well, yes, no one warned them. And in fact, I want us to watch these shots. Yes, these are the photos taken by fellow journalists. And again, the basements. If we did not know that this was the Kursk region, one would think that it was somewhere on the territory of Ukraine, the same handwritten messages of civilians as in Mariupol, where the drama theater wrote, C-H-I-L-D-R-E-N, in capital letters. But, in fact, this did not stop the Russian pilots in any way. Well, now we see the same thing in the Kursk region. That's not it, Katya. One thing I want to say is, let's be careful with analogies. Do you know the difference between Bukha and Sudra? I think that it will continue to be different in this way. I do not believe that it can be otherwise. Otherwise, you and I will meet here and break our hair. Bukha differs from Sudra in that Russian military units carried out punitive operations in Bukha. They deliberately gathered people whom they considered disloyal, and just all men, and killed them. Imagine that the Ukrainian military will look for all the men in Sudra in order to shoot and bury, I can't. I think that this will not happen. And this is what distinguishes Sudra from Bukha. What is definitely not different is that in both Bukha and Sudra the population is hiding from the Russian military. Because, again, Ukrainian journalists say that 140 aerial bombs were dropped literally in one day while they were there. This is what I talked about above, because the forest is cut down, chips fly. Yes, these people will die, and no one will feel sorry, no one cares that peaceful Russian citizens live there, because the main thing is to liberate the land from the Ukrainian military. 
and the fact that all the inhabitants of Sudra will be destroyed along the way, well, these are our people, we do what we want with them. Yes, it is. As for the evacuation, this is an important point, we have recorded this. In this sense, of course, the Russian pilots who drop bombs on Sudra will hopefully be restored by Ukrainian air defense. Because the life of a Russian pilot is not as dear to me as the life of my grandmother from this basement. And the pilots of the Russian aviation, who were supposed to protect the happy life of their citizens, have turned into war criminals in a normal country. War criminals who destroy peaceful cities of another country for no reason. And Patriot missiles usually lead to retaliation in such cases. But as for the evacuation, you need to be careful and precise, because in Sudrat the evacuation was impossible due to the fact that cars, including buses, could not enter there. Who would let them in? The Ukrainian military occupied the city and realized that the military could arrive in any civilian car, as it happens in military conflicts. Therefore, it is clear why civilian equipment was not allowed, and it was impossible to evacuate the occupied city. Another question is how people will be treated in the occupied territory. This, in my opinion, should have been shown to Ukrainian journalists very carefully and in detail. I can imagine how difficult it was to get there with a Russian passport through all the prohibitions and get the necessary permits. But I can say for sure that the cynicism of the Russian authorities about the evacuation is, of course, very peculiar. The evacuation is advisory in nature, it was said in the first hours. I like it, we recommend evacuating. Something like this could be said, I recommend being rich, being poor is bad. It is better to be rich and healthy than poor and sick. But no one understands what to do with this recommendation. And sitting in basements could have stopped if they hadn't been bombed. But to stop these bombings, by the way, this is an important issue that you raise, about the bombing of Russian cities with Russian populations. You know, this is a media war. In any other war in the past, they would have bombed and would not have said a word, and all the victims would have been written off as the atrocity of the Ukrainian military. But now it is not possible to do this. This grandmother was alive, we saw her. If the grandmother does not die from a bullet in the back of the head, and I think she will die from something else, and God grant that she does not die, of course, but if she dies from a fragment of an exploded aerial bomb, then we understand who will be to blame for the fact that this bomb exploded. But again, we know how Putin likes to stage provocations when he cannot solve one problem. Therefore, he is doing everything to distract the people from this problem. Therefore, recently the security service of Ukraine has been saying that it is possible that in the near future they may come up with another provocation, for example, dressing up in the uniform of the Ukrainian military, since there are enough Ukrainian soldiers in captivity on the territory of Russia for their uniform to be used. Used. This may include blowing up a high-rise building, terrorist attacks in the subway, in Crocus, and so on. I think that now the Ukrainian army should not occupy or stop it in any way. And in the sense that, you know, what a thing, I think that Ukrainian officers understand perfectly well what is happening now. And they know that the Ukrainian army is fighting in the crosshairs of millions of eyes around the world, who make sure that the moral and ethical position, the superposition of Ukraine is not broken and violated. At the same time, everyone understands that military actions are actions that lead to the death of people. And nothing can stop the Ukrainian offensive. After its completion, of course, there will be a debriefing, and there will probably be an assessment of some incidents that could be called abuse of authority or even war crimes. All this will be considered later. Now Ukraine in its right defends its country by the ways and methods with which this country attacked Ukraine itself. The only thing I can say in this sense, with a note of despair, joy and hope, is my weak appeal.
I think that people in these territories are well aware without me that any unjustified excessive aggressive actions against civilians do not benefit Ukraine. I think a Ukrainian soldier understands this better than a person sitting in front of a laptop screen in another country, and I hope that there will be few such cases. And in all other senses, listen, one Ukrainian friend of mine said, we will not seize the Kursk nuclear power plant, because we are not a country that is a party to nuclear blackmail, like the Russian Federation. To be honest, I think that it would be good to exchange the Kursk nuclear power plant for the Zaporizhzhia nuclear power plant. I would very much like the city of Enerhodar to stop being occupied by Russian units and return to the bosom of my home country, Ukraine. Yes, everyone would like that. You know, I would also like to watch a Russian broadcast with you. Again, about what they allow themselves to say now, this line between what can be said and what cannot be said and who can be spoken against, does it still exist or has it already been erased? What should we do in this situation? It will be very difficult for us for a couple of weeks. I don't envy editors who choose stories for programs, because you can see what is happening, and the situation is unstable. It is very difficult to maintain optimism. I'm not talking about our media. I work in the local meetings program. Bad things happen in war, you know? Ramzan Kadyrov said three days. Let's not blame Ramzan Kadyrov. This topic should be raised, especially now. Let's not discuss this topic of Akhmat and Ramzan Kadyrov out of sin. They decided to move away from sin, and Kadyrov was left alone, because everyone saw what Akhmat Silo is. From the very beginning of the Great War in Ukraine, it was said that in Ukraine there is Akhmat Chai with a name. And they have not heard anything about Akhmat's strength. We talked about the fact that usually the Kadyrovites are in the barrier detachments and they are not visible on the front lines. No one has ever seen them. Well, all they can do is shoot TikToks and dance lick in the Kursk region before they entered the armed forces of Ukraine. And then you can't find them with fire. Nevertheless, here we go back to the fact that the situation is difficult, the situation is ambiguous, the situation is very unoptimistic, there will be another two or two weeks. And that's all. That is, Putin says that literally at the meeting he says, the situation in the district is difficult. To date, 28 settlements are under the control of the enemy. The depth of penetration into the territory of the Kursk region is 12 kilometers. The width along the front is 40 kilometers. Listen, Alexei Borisovich, this military department will report to you on the width and depth there. Tell us about the socio-economic situation. Tell us about the people, do not get involved in what is now under occupation or controlled by the armed forces of Ukraine. This is not your parish. You tell me about the people, says Putin, who is allegedly very worried about them. Apparently, you need to calculate the budget, 10,000 rubles will be enough or not enough to pay for each. However, Putin claims that nothing is happening in the Kursk region, and that there is complete silence. However, on the air, in telegram channels and in other sources, a panic mood is observed. Of course, this is very noticeable. The fact is that I have repeated many times on your broadcasts and I will repeat again. One of the horrors of war is that, as I noticed from my conversations with my acquaintances who remained in Russia, for the overwhelming majority of Russians who support the war, what is happening is perceived as a football match. They perceived it not as a real tragedy where people die, but as finding out which team is cooler, Russia or Ukraine, watching the events with beer as if they were a football match that they were rooting for. It seems to me that one of the reasons for this perception is that the intonation that I saw in Norkin's work on NTV resembles the discussion of the loss of the Russian national football team. To be honest, I would like to say to the people who are now talking about this with optimism that they are fundamentally mistaken. They are still discussing the situation as if it were just a goal scored in a football match.
This is a real dehumanization and tragedy, what is happening. And for Putin, he is silent about it, because he understands what is happening. This is a man who decided for himself that he would be Stalin in a very liberal and creatively developed country. And so he decided that, like Stalin, going to the grave before his death, he would present to his future generations some kind of empire invented by him, which the whole world is afraid of, which has huge territories, powerful resources, a huge army, a lot of people. This is very important, because it seems to me that Putin, if a person is deprived of empathy or has become deprived of empathy, begins to care only about numbers and reporting. According to reporting, there should be a lot of people. There are more milk yields, more in Russia, more people, which means you sent them well. And now that he realizes that his days in the country's leadership are coming to an end, he chose in 2011 to turn the country in the other direction. He said that liberalism is nonsense, and we will take a different path. His path led not to the fact that there was more of everything, but to the fact that there was less of everything. And even the territory of Russia, a sacred thing for him, has also now shrunk by a thousand square kilometers. But it has not decreased, it is not controlled by Putin. Maybe it will shrink, maybe there will be the Kursk People's Republic. Why not, or simply Kursk Democratic. But this, it seems to me, is such a terrible blow for him. A blow not even to his ego, but to his idea of how he should end. That is, he actually ends his life as a complete fiasco. And this is a punishment for excessive pride, for the fact that he condemned thousands and hundreds of millions of people to misfortune, for the fact that he interrupted the trajectories of people's lives that could have been of great benefit to themselves and the whole world. He cut off their capabilities, pressed them, said, no, the green metal is our future and our happiness, we will live on it. And all this led to nothing, to this fiasco. That is why, it seems to me, we observe this. Well, I think that in addition to the psychological aspect, which is clearly present here, looking at these shots, you begin to wonder if he is really offered to go somewhere so that someone else, even Belusov, can do better things. Maybe this way it will be possible to at least resolve the issue with the Kursk region in negotiations. But there is one more important point that we did not discuss. Negotiation is a really important aspect. In the current conditions, Ukraine's negotiating position is such that it is possible to return all its territories without making Putin lose face. This is a very convenient position. Under the pressure of sanctions and because of the hard coin that Russians should despise, and Putin has ordered to despise and despised in recent years, there is an opportunity for negotiations. He cannot return the Zaporizhia, Kherson, Donetsk and Luhansk regions to Ukraine in exchange for his native Kursk, given what they have been saying all these years. But even if this fails under Putin, it may be done in the next period after his departure. This is a very comfortable position for negotiations. None of the subsequent Russian leaders, sitting down at the negotiating table during such an exchange, loses face, but, on the contrary, at first glance, only gains it. That's one thing. What I wanted to say, I think it is important. But I would like to say the second thing. I have one close acquaintance of mine, with whom we grew up together in childhood. He is not rare, he writes somewhere, somewhere he works in government agencies. I don't ask where, I think it's a security officer. At the end of 2022, he wrote me a snide message on Instagram. Well, they say that Russia has run out of shells, ha ha ha, what do you believe? Then it turned out that we saw this show of Gerasim and Shoigu, where are the shells? And recently he wrote me a rather ironic message that, they say, the armed forces of Ukraine no longer exist, that's it, the armed forces of Ukraine are over. You see, the armed forces of Ukraine are over. I didn't even write anything back to him now. What is there to write? The remnants simply entered the Kursk region and sort of ended there. We remembered Belusov here. The Minister of Defense of Russia held a meeting with colleagues from Burkina Faso and Niger within the framework of the Military Technical Forum, Army 2024. Well, in fact, here he is, Belusov. Let me remind you that there are hostilities in the Kursk region, and Belusov, despite this, smiles, holds meetings and looks completely cheerful and cheerful. Of course, there are questions. Maybe he asked Burkina Faso for military units that can guard the courses of the region, I don't know. 
But, nevertheless, a state of emergency and increased security and security measures have been introduced in Moscow. In three regions in Russia, the CTO regime has been introduced, and, in fact, the Army Forum 2024. Did you watch the movie, Secret Fairway, as a child? I watched it, an old Soviet film. At the end of the Soviet Union, a five-part film was shot about the adventures of a Soviet pilot aboard a German submarine that sailed on the ocean. According to a special signal, in the last days of the war, a boat was supposed to moor on the German shore, pick up Hitler and take him to Brazil so that he could spend his old age in happiness and peace. But the captain of this boat at the end of the film refused to carry out the task, and Hitler committed suicide. The captain himself sailed to Brazil. And now you see the footage from this film with your own eyes. This is all very serious, including what is happening with Russian contacts with the military. Russia has taken over Africa, colonized it over the past 10 years. It lay as if it were nobody's, and it was noticeably difficult. What is Russia doing in Africa? In Africa, Russia mines unaccounted diamonds and gold that do not fall into the Russian budget. A very expensive tree that is sold through Copenhagen to London. In short, he earns hundreds of billions of dollars that are not taken into account and go past the cash register. In addition, Russia is probably selling some of its natural resources through Africa, which it cannot sell on the market due to sanctions. It is understandable, for example, that Russia sells gold through Armenia, but it is not yet clear how it sells its diamonds. Belusov is engaged in establishing contacts with security officials from Africa, who should ensure the continuation of sales and the accumulation of income. This can be preparation for a possible outcome when the situation becomes critical and the team is in danger. Another issue is that it is not at all certain that these people will be able to find a submarine that will take them to those billions. But what they are doing in Africa, and what they are meeting for, is to agree on a guarantee of the safety of the funds and their value. I am sure that as soon as they run out there, this money will instantly go to them. But, however, it is not a fact that these funds will go to Burkina Faso. But there will be enterprising people who will arrange a real war for this money, who have passed by the cash register of the Russian budget, traces of which we will see later. Finally, I want to ask more about the mobilization of 2024, because Bloomberg writes that it is possible on the territory of Russia. We remember that Putin tried to avoid this decision as much as he could, because it really hits his rating. Although it is almost impossible to determine his rating in the conditions in which both Putin and Russia now live. Nevertheless, do you think they will come to mobilization? Because, well, again, they say that mobilization is carried out in two cases. Either you win, or you lose. Katya, I'll tell you this. This is not an obvious idea, but now I can prove it with absolute certainty, it depends only on the Russians. Like everything else that happened in Russia, it depended not on Putin, but on the Russians. Here is an example for you. When Putin decided to completely close YouTube, the number of complaints, dissatisfaction and measurements by the sociological services of the FSO increased sharply. The dissatisfaction of Russians on this occasion was so great that we have seen an incredible picture over the past week. How YouTube was turned on and off. It was as if two people were standing and holding the crane. One pulled in this direction, and the other in that direction. Turn on, turn off, they are dissatisfied. Turn on, no, we need to turn it off. No, turn on. Turn off. This is what happened to YouTube. It turns out that the opinion of Russians about YouTube matters to Putin. You know, I assume that the opinion of Russians on everything else also matters to Putin. It's just that Russians don't know about it and don't express their opinion. If the Russians want or agree with the mobilization, it will take place. If the Russians treat the next wave of death in a senseless war in the same way as the closure of YouTube, then the mobilization will not take place.
and Putin will do what he wants if he is given. That's all, in fact, if there are no consequences, he will announce mobilization. If the Russians now continue to react to the situation as they react to the closure of YouTube, then the mobilization may not take place, especially if conscripts begin to return dead. This war ceases to be a movie epic with mercenaries, who are not sorry, since they receive money for their work. Thank you for being with us all this time. Leave likes and comments, we really appreciate it. Subscribe to the YouTube channel of Channel 24 and, of course, take care of yourself. See you later.